this is going to be a bit about motivating and inspiring, uh, talk a bit about what we're doing at the university, probably get some feedback from you to see how you think it's going, uh, and really maybe talk about the importance of this stuff. So I've got this presentation, we'll see how it goes. Um, let's have a bash. So you reckon it'll work? Okay. <laughs> Why are you hiding then if you think it'll work? Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at this. I've got a couple of little videos in here to show you. Will you fight? No! We will run! And we will live! Shame on you! This could be the greatest night of our lives. But you're gonna let it be the worst. And I guarantee a week won't go by in your life. You won't regret walking out, letting them get the best of you. Well... I'm not going home. We've got too far! And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. A day may come when the courage of men fails. But it is not this day. The line must be drawn here. This far, no farther. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. You're gonna work harder than you ever worked before. But that's fine, we'll just get tougher with it. If a person grits his teeth and shows real determination, Failure is not an option. That's how winning is done. Believe me when I say we can break this army here. And win just one for the Gipper. But I say to you, what every warrior has known since the beginning of time, you've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog mean. If you would be free men, then you must fight to fulfill that promise. They just cut out their living guts one inch at a time. And they will know what we can do. <laughs> Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions. You're like a big bear, man. This is your time. Seize the day. Never surrender. Victory or death. Bitch, the Chicago way. Who's with me? Clap. Clap, don't let him die. Clap. All right, let's fly. I'm gentlemen in England, now I bet. Shall no, my name is the Lord. When I tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our Independence Day! How do people feel after that video? A bit lifted, yeah. Anything else? Sorry? Excited? <laughs> Motivated? Yeah, that sort of thing is, it gets you going, doesn't it? I mean, those, what were some of the films there that you saw? Anyone reckon? Braveheart was the big one, yeah. Never Ending Story. Various Star Trek. Yeah. Rocky? Yeah. I mean, who can fail to be expired when... Uh, expired, <laughs> inspired, <laughs> when Rocky runs up those stairs in Philadelphia, you know, and uh, jumping up the stairs. You know, they, they, they used to have a statue of him at the top of those stairs. They've actually taken it away. The new mayor didn't like it, so they took it away. And actually, in the last Rocky film, he, uh, he mentions that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it makes you feel good. It can be uplifting. Anything else about those uh, kind of films that struck you? Was there any common theme running through any of those? Preparing for battle. Uh, war and battle was a big theme in there, wasn't it? That it was about going into battle. And uh, I think that's something that's important that we will uh, talk about as we go on. Anything else? Don't give up. Don't give up. Yep. That's uh, really important, isn't it? That it is someone, there is someone motivating, there is someone inspiring, and then there's uh, a group of followers. Yep. Anything else? Anything else that struck anyone? Yeah, uniting people, bringing them together. And also that really, okay, there are a lot of people in there that were inspiring big groups like the Braveheart, you know, Wallace uh, talking to the hordes of uh, Scottish uh, warriors. Uh, but there was also stuff on a much smaller scale there. What was some of the smaller scale stuff? 
Yeah, but what, um, there was that, and they was the big people. There is that person, but there were the, what I'm saying is there were the big groups, people talking to thousands of people to inspire them. But there was some smaller scale stuff. So can anyone remember any of the clips which was on us? The Star Trek one was one on one, one person inspiring one other person. There was a hockey team. Yep. Yeah, classroom. So really, motivation and inspiration isn't just about sort of inspiring big numbers of people. It can even be one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I always like that um, sort of uh, observation that you're actually, every time you do something, you're actually changing the culture of the place, you're changing the place. And really, it's up to your decision. Are you going to change things for the better or for the worse. So when you come in and you talk to you, uh, people at work, are you changing things for the better or for the worse? So do you come in and talk about how terrible things are or do you talk about how good things are? And I guess that's uh, something, I think probably between, it's very difficult, I guess, to motivate people around negative, isn't it? I think. Okay, we will turn the lights back down a little bit. I've put this up uh, as the first slide about the kind of things that do motivate people. And you've probably, if you've done any study around this area before, you've become across really factors that motivate people and then hygiene factors. So really, I, I found this picture of perhaps this guy with smelly armpits. Now, if he didn't, if he didn't have smelly armpits, that's not going to particularly motivate you to like him. But if he does have smelly armpits, that's a hygiene fact. You're not probably going to be motivated. So there's a whole lot of things that you have to have in place to get people motivated, but they don't actually motivate people. Can anyone think of anything in a university? It has to be there. And if it's not there, people are completely demotivated or not even there at all. But just because it's there doesn't motivate people. I, let me tell you one and then you'll get what I'm talking about. Money. Money. People often think that people in organisations are motivated by money. And there's all of those things that if we give people money, they work hard enough. Uh, if we give incentive schemes, they work hard enough. In fact, all the research doesn't show that. That is really a hygiene factor. Okay, it will have a motivating effect up to a point, but really how much you pay people, or as long as they feel that they are being paid adequately, that doesn't really motivate them. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, sort of management science over a number of years has been kind of trying to motivate people with some of those hygiene factors. What are the other things that might be in the, uh, um, in the university that need to be there but don't actually motivate people. Gen general resources, I mean, do you feel really motivated because the photocopy has got some paper in it? No, probably not. If it didn't, how do you feel if the, you go to use the photocopy and it hasn't got paper in it? How do you feel? Pissed off. <laughs> you want to kick it and throw it out the window. So these factors are there, and if they're not there, they can demotivate. If you don't feel that you're being paid adequately enough, you can feel demotivated. But really, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, once they're there, you can't motivate people uh, with those factors. Then there's a lot of things, um, you know, that are real motivation factors, real motivating factors, and I guess they're the ones that we're going to uh, look at today. Just, just before we f leave this slide, just talking about hygiene factors and pay in particular. Do, I mean, do people feel, is that right? Is pay just a hygiene factor or is it a motivating factor? What do you think? Can it ever be a motivating factor? Give me an example where it would be a motivating factor. Y yeah. Sorry? <laughs> After you get them. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think there is. I mean, if we said, look, uh, we've got a special scheme today, 
uh, and we really want you to all go out and pick up litter because the university is looking pretty scary. It's not actually, but let's say there's a lot of litter around the place. Um, here's a bag each, so off you go, go and pick up some litter. Do you feel very well motivated to pick up litter? If you see any litter in the university, do you pick it up? Yeah, yeah me too. But uh, are you very, very motivated to go and pick up litter at the moment? Would anyone like to do that instead of this? Pro probably be more interesting. If everyone was out there doing that, you'd have a good yeah. time. But, but what if I said now, okay, anyone that can fill this bag up with litter uh, by lunchtime, we give $10,000 to? <laughs> <laughs> would, that, that, would that motivate you? Would you all say, well, sorry, I've got to go somewhere and go out and start filling? Yeah? Yeah, so in those cases, uh, sort of money and bonuses can motivate. The problem is that's just sort of common sense, and then that's put it out to use bonuses sort of all over the place. In fact, there was only, until recently, there was only one person in the university that was on a bonus scheme. Anyone know who that was? Do you know Joe? I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was, it was me. I was on a bonus scheme. So the first year they said, you've done a great job, we're going to give you the full 10%. Oh, great. I mean, that was really good. I mean, I'm not going to sneeze at that. Second year, done a really good job. We've got all this growth. 10%. What happened this year? Went along and, oh, you've done a really good job. 9%. 9%. Now, that's fantastic. 9% on top of your salary. Think of your salary for the year, then you get 9% extra. I mean, that's pretty good, isn't it? But how do you feel? How did I feel? Yeah, what the hell am I giving me 10 again? <laughs> what do I do different this year? I didn't think that at all. I just thought, huh. and in fact, uh, what I've done now is I've, I've got rid of that bonus. I think the bonus is silly because it, it didn't motivate me. So if you go onto the web and even go into YouTube, uh, and have a look at bonuses and motivation. There's some really good research on there which actually shows that bonuses don't work. Except for one time. When do bonuses actually work? Can you think when a bonus might work? Yeah, look, I think you're exactly right on that. I think you're exactly right. But, yeah, it's not recognition. I think that's about recognition, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but the, the research shows that individual bonuses, monetary bonuses, don't really work, but group bonuses do. If we actually said to uh, the professional staff uh, looking after the science area, and we've got them all here today, uh, if we said to you guys, look, as a group, we're going to have a group bonus, and uh, this is what we want you to try and achieve, when you do that and you get groups of people working together, uh, that tends to really motivate people. Whereas, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Judy. We say to Jude, but if we say Jude is going to get the bonus and then we give her the bonus, how do the rest of you feel? Yeah, pissed <laughs> off. And that's how I felt because I think the university is going just incredibly well. I mean, we're just going gangbusters about it. We're now the fastest growing university in Australia. So you've heard me say fastest growing in Queensland. We are now the fastest growing in Australia. We're just going fantastically well, but why would you single out one person to give a 10% bonus? I mean, you know, it's about all of us, everyone in this room working together to make that happen. So I think bonuses, monetary bonuses are a bit silly. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, see what we've got in there. Right, good. It didn't work. Okay, I want to look at some of the things um, that we've been doing at uh, get rid of this thing um, at this university, and maybe this is just my reflections on it. What I've been thinking. I've been here now three and a half years, uh, and what I've been trying to achieve since I got here. So we'll have a look at some of this and see what you think about it. Now. Uh, the first thing is, uh, the first thing I put in place when I got here was 
where we're going in the future. And we said, you know, it, it's hard to think about three years ago. We, do you remember we just had that report that said we were going to be broke? Everyone was, you know, it was a national sport to bash CQU in the press. You went along to conferences and everyone was smiling and they say, where are you from? And you say, I'm CQU. And they say, oh, and kind of, <laughs> a kind of edge away across the room. For some reason, that's how it got to. Anyway, so we said, look, in two years, we're going to be financially sustainable. Uh, no one will question our finances. Five years, we're going to be this really strong regional university. And in 10 years, we're going to be a great university, one of Australia's great universities. And a lot of that's going to be based around this concept of engagement. So that's, I think, the, where we set ourselves. But then how did we get people behind that and to move that forward? Because, you know, within two years, we were financially sustainable. And I don't know if you saw the article in The Australian this week, which actually picked us out as one of the really strong performers financially. Um, and it dug below the headlines. I mean, on the headlines, we actually made a loss of $4 million. And Melbourne University made a surplus of $200 million. Sounds good, doesn't it? Until they'd actually done the analysis and actually gone and looked at the books and looked what was happy, actually happening. What they found was University of Melbourne had made a loss of $40 million, and CQU had actually made a surplus of $7 million. So uh, that really shows the true picture. And that's kind of what happens with universities. We've been spending down a bit on our reserves. So we've spent down to build all the buildings, but that has brought in far more students. So our operations are actually running in profit, but we're investing in the future. Uh, when you look at uh, University of Melbourne, they're getting lots of grants and things, but they're actually spending more than they earn on their operations. So we're in a better position. I don't know why I went on about that, really. Anyway, so. Two years, tick, sustainable. We hit that. We've done it. No one's questioning. In fact, people are saying, financially, we're perhaps one of the stronger universities. No debt at this point. We'll have next week. Um, right, five years, we're going to be a really strong regional university through courses, research, doing what our communities need. Well, we're three and a half years in, and I think there's no doubt we will give a tick on that. We're now running all the health courses, the law courses. We're running just about every program our region needs in this region. And we've also having a stepped increase in our research. So we're doing the research that the region needs. So I think that in a year and a half, we can have a big party because we can tick off and not only say we're a strong regional, probably one of the strongest regionals. And we're in the run group now, the Regional Universities Network. When you look at that group, on a lot of indicators, we're at the top. So we can tick off on that one. And then a great university in 10 years. And I think this is our challenge now, is what do we mean by that? Because if you go back and look at that plan, it was a bit vague about what a great university is. So what we need to do now is define that great university. So anyway, that's where we set ourselves where we were going. So how did we go about actually uh, motivating people at the university to get involved with that? Well, I think the strategies I used are around creating a vision, building a roadmap to get there, communication, be inclusive, recognition, think about how you're going to operate your critics and lead by doing an urgency. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. Now, I've really fortunate because I get to play with the whole university. And God, that's good fun. But all of you do have areas that you're responsible for. And it doesn't really matter whether you're heading a program, whether you're heading, you're looking after a particular laboratory or a particular part of university services. It doesn't really matter. You've got that area. Uh, and really, you can do all of this stuff. It might be on a smaller scale. It might be like some of those people in that first clip that might only even be one-on-one. -on -one. It might be one to students. But you can motivate and do use these strategies, whether it's a whole university or a part of that. 
I believe, but we, you might want to come and tell me I'm talking rubbish at the end. Okay, so the first thing is, I think you've got to create a picture. I mean, and I think that's what was lacking in the university for a little while. I think if you look into the history of the university, the university has an incredible history, and I think there were some people that did create that vision, that did say what we could be right at the beginning. But I might be wrong, I'll look at Jo, because she's been here for donkey's years. Yeah. You've been here longer, haven't you? Who's been here longest? How long have you been here? How long have you been here, Jo? 16? God. Anyone can beat 16? Oh. Oh, yeah, newcomers. <laughs> Patricia, 37. Do you think that's right, that at the beginning there was a real vision and a real vibe? Yeah, but, but yeah, a lot of that's got lost on the way. And like when you came along, like saying, you've got the vision, but you've got to follow it. And you know, you can Yeah, I, and I think it was all of us. I mean, I, you know, you can keep saying it's one person, but in an organisation with getting on for 2,000 staff, 20,000 students, running across every state in Australia apart from Tasmania, you can't have, it's got to be a joint. If I had to come in and said, look, the vision is that we're going to uh, you know, do something really stupid. I mean, it would, if people didn't buy into it, then we wouldn't have got anywhere. Uh, but that's what you need to do, is, is paint a picture of where we could, you could be, and that can be in your own individual areas. What could your individual area be? Where could we be in five years, two years, ten years, next year? What could we be? And once you've got that, and if you get a, um, uh, people on board with that, then talk about it all the time. Never let up on that. And for me, it was around that word, word engagement. We will be Australia's most engaged university. We will be that. And actually don't talk about it if we're going to try and be. We might be. Actually, we will be. There's no question about this. This is the vision and we, we will be it and then talk about it. Um, and sometimes I sometimes feel I've, I've led up on that a little bit. The first year, every second word I said was engagement. I think next year, last year, I dropped off. So this year you're probably going to get it worse than ever around engagement. Um, and I'm a great believer in self-fulfilling prophe prophecy. And I can think of examples of this. Um, I, I once went and worked in a, uh, as a head of a school, and the school was pretty downbeat, and they'd been through a few problems. And I actually started saying, and this was a medical imaging, a radiography school, I started saying, this is the best school of radiography in the UK. We are the best. And I said that internally, I said it externally. People laughed at the beginning, but you know what? After about five years, everyone recognised it as the best school of radiography. People do, if you, if you say we are the best, you become the best. If you say we're crap, you'll probably become crap. Um, and you've probably seen that research with kids. If you, if you take a kid in a classroom, of just av an average kid, pick any kid. Um, uh, let's use Judy, because I know her name now, so you'll get picked on a lot. <laughs> If we whisper in Judy's ear, Judy, look, I'm really sorry that you're here with this lot, you know, uh, because you are far brighter, far more intelligent than this lot. If we whisper that in, in the ear, or if you do that with a kid at school, it's amazing. You see their results and their performance will just increase and increase. Likewise, um, if you go and tell Ian, you, you'll screw up the computer, you're no good at computers you'll actually see his results drop off. So self-fulfilling prophecy is really, uh, really important. So again, if you, you do this in your workplace and tell, talk about this, that you're the best, you, you become the best. I mean, if we've got the best tech support team in science in the sector in Australia, if you start talking in those terms, I can almost guarantee you will become the best tech support team in Australia in science. Brilliant, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. 
Okay, so that vision, and, and show people what we can be. So we will be a great university. I mean, we'd be a great university. I mean, here we are having bloody pictures of us in the Australian as bottom feeders. We've got a report that says we're all going to be bankrupt in, um, what was it, 18 months, all of that crap. And then you've got this idiot saying, we're going to be one of Australia's great universities. We're going to be up there with the top. I think people are starting to believe that now. Uh, so, but you've got to have that vision. Now, it, it's one thing having a vision. It's one thing having a vision and saying, you know, we are going to rule the world. But you need a roadmap to get there. And, you know, you do get, you do hear universities. Like I heard uh, the vice chancellor of a university, I won't um, tell you where it was, but it was in Western Australia. And the initials were ECU. But I'm not going to say anywhere else. And the VC was called Cox. Anyway, but uh, he went into that university and he said, we are going to be a great research university. We are going to be one of Australia's great research universities, up there with the group of eight. You know, well maybe he is and maybe he isn't, I don't know, but it sounded like a lot of rhetoric because what you actually need is a roadmap to get to where you want to be. And you've got to have a realistic vision. I would never say that this is going to be Australia's strongest research university. Because in my lifetime, it ain't. We're going to be a lot better at research. I think we're going to be in the top half of universities. But to think that we're going to be up there with UQ and Monash and Sydney, we're not. 200 years? Maybe. Maybe 100 years. Uh, I don't know. But You've got to have a realistic vision, and then with that realistic vision, you've then got to have a roadmap of how you're going to get there. So if we are going to be the most engaged university, how do we get there? There has to be a clear way forward, and you need to drive the university down that road. So what we put in place were key performance indicators, and it's amazing, three years ago, I don't think there were any, well, there were, I think there were seven uh, KPIs for the university. We then went mad and I think we created about 200 KPIs and now we've drawn it back to, I don't know, around about 20 or 30 KPIs. So these are the key performance indicators and we started measuring the managers on that, the heads of school, the deans, the DVCs. These are the KPIs because these are all about driving us to where we want to be. Uh, funding models, we put the funding models in that would encourage this. So if uh, part of it was about growth. So if you, if you bring in the students, you, you get the money. So we put in a funding model. And we got started planning. And um, in the early days, there wasn't great planning. There was, uh, you know, the plan was written probably by the vice chancellor at the top, taken to council, and then put in a filing cabinet. Hopefully, we've got the plans you know, right down through the organisation because the plans really are the roadmap to get to where we wanted to go. So, is that impacted on any of you, those KPIs, plans, funding models? Anyone not? Good, hopefully we've got that and we've, so we've, we've got that uh, uh, roadmap and where we're going. What have we got next? Communicate, get out there and just talk. If, if you know, communicate, communicate. Uh, so I've done staff forums, staff conferences, groups, individuals, public forums, external stakeholders, blogs. I need to write a new blog. Uh, and the website, Twitter. Uh, any of you on Twitter? You don't follow me, do you? Oh, good. Get onto Twitter. Yeah. So I never see any tweets from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Out there watching. Yeah. <laughs> the social media is in, in, in really important. So, you know, I'd say get onto Twitter. Follow me. <laughs> uh, so, communicate, communicate, communicate. And when you think that you're communicating twice as much as you need to, you're probably communicating in a quarter of what you should be doing. Um, and again, that's a, it doesn't matter whether it's a whole university or a part of the university, you've got to talk about these things all, all the time. And you've got to be on message all the time. So, um, 
Let's have a look at some communicators. Let's have a look at some communicators and let's see what we think of them. Uh, okay, we go down, lights low. And we do a bit of, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask you what you think about these people. And let's, what you're looking for these is what they're doing. Are they using any techniques? What's their strategies in communication? So. When Napoleon laid Boulogne for a year with his flat bottom boats and his grand army, he was told by someone, there are bitter weeds in England. There are certainly a great many more of them since the British Expeditionary Force returned. Sir, I have myself full confidence that if all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and if the best arrangements are made, as they are being made, we shall prove ourselves once more able to defend our island home, to ride out the storm of war, and to outlive the menace of tyranny if necessary, for years, if necessary, alone. At any rate, that is what we are going to try to do. That is the resolve of His Majesty's government, every man of them. That is the will of Parliament and the nation, the British Empire and the French Republic, linked together in their cause and in their need, will defend to the death their native soil, aiding each other like good comrades to the utmost of their strength. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. A bit boring? <laughs> Didn't find it bland? Well, let's put it into context. That was actually, uh, uh, that speech was made after Dunkirk. So basically the, uh, the British Expeditionary Force in it was fighting with the French. They'd been driven out of continental Europe uh, and pushed across at Dunkirk. Uh, in fact, there was a second Dunkirk as well. But anyway, so they were pushed out and this speech was made, Churchill often looks like he's talking off the cuff, but he didn't. He prepared speeches and you know every nuance, if you look at his notes, of how he was delivering, but he got up and talked as if he was talking off the cuff. This is one where he did talk more or less off the cuff because he, he just came in and made that impromptu speech because that speech was made just what they thought was on the point of invasion. They thought the, the Germans were going to follow them over the, uh, uh, the channel and really Britain was defenceless absolutely defenceless at that point and um, the Germans could have really probably came in and sought spoke to Britain. So what, so you don't, a bit boring, not very motivating, oh dear that's a shame. Uh, but any techniques that are there? So what was any techniques in there? So th I agree, uh, repetition, repetition is, well, I, I think that's very motivating and strong speech, but 
obviously I'm in a minority, but that reputation, anything else that he's doing? He was copying people at all levels. Yep. And he was bringing them together, wasn't he? We're kind of in this together. Uh, and, you know, we, we are in a tough spot, but we're all in... And that's often a really motivating thing to do. And I think we may have done that in the university, or are still doing it in that university. It's kind of us against the rest of them. It's us, you know, here, he's saying it's us against the rest of the world. And in some ways, I think in those early days of the renewal plan, you know, we knew that people were looking down their noses at us. We knew people, we went to conferences and people wouldn't have a dance with us. We all had to dance with Janelle Kidd because no one else had danced with us. <laughs> uh, and it, you kept, that's quite a motivating thing. You know, we're in this together. We're a team and screw them. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, that's quite a powerful thing. I think you're exactly right. And if you look at that speech again, he's actually talking to three groups of people. If you look at it, well, I won't play it again because it's boring. <laughs> Greatest speech ever made, it's boring. <laughs> well, maybe not. He's talking to three people, he's talking to the, the British people and saying we're going to pull together and we're going to fight together and it's, and it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. He's also talking to the French, not actually at that stage the French resistance, he's talking about the, the French Republic. At that point he thought that he could keep the French fighting and the French wouldn't surrender. And he, uh, he literally just got off a plane uh, from Paris because he'd been talking. But he was also pretty sure they, he, he, he also had deep worries that they were going to just cave in and surrender, which they did. But he's trying to rally them as well. And who was the third group that he was talking to? He's t talking to, well, maybe four groups, yeah, because there was something there to the empire. The empire will carry on. But there was another really important group. The the ah, screw the Germans, he wasn't talking to that bunch. Um, you, you're right, the Allies, but the Allies that weren't the Allies at that point. He talks about the new world coming to the rescue of the old world. Britain being the old world, the new world being America. And, you know, half of Winston Churchill's war was actually about trying to persuade the Americans to come into the war and getting aid from the Americans. So uh, it's interesting that, you know, OK, he's motivated in one group, but he's also reaching out to others. And I think, um, you know, the really clever people, I go and sometimes sit in, in school meetings or directorate meetings, and you get the head of school or the head of directorate or the head of section talking to their staff and they're motivating their staff, but you can also see there's a bit of a message coming to me as well, but doing it that way, and I think that's what he's doing. Um, and that can be motivating as well, that you, you know, you, you're actually showing that you're standing up for a group and trying to get other people involved. Okay, a very old speech, not particularly, I'm gonna show you another old one now, see whether you like this one any better. And again, let's have a look for what, what it's another he, uh, what he's trying to do, uh, what techniques is using and what uh, message is trying to get across. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream.
What do we make of that one? Repetition? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Which was the repetition? What did he use? I, as have, dream. I have a dream. Yeah, I have a dream. On with that. And then many years later, we see Barack Obama using what in repetition? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. So, any, what else is he using there? What do we well, think? Then he, he goes on to point out the, the different things. You know. He's pointing the picture again as where we are, but also painting a picture. I mean, it's, it's probably the best example of having that vision, of painting the vision. This is where we could be. He has a dream that this is where we could be. So, is that. Um, definitely with this one, he's, he's unwavering that, you know, this is how it will be. This is how it will be one day. There's no wavering there. Was there any wavering with Churchill? There is a little bit, actually. If you read that, he does actually acknowledge that, the, uh, that England could actually be invaded and overrun. He actually says that. He says, and if, and what does he say? And, uh, and if, and I don't accept this for a minute, we are overrun. Then he starts talking about being overrun. It's a bit like, you know, if you're at the uni saying, you know, we will be the most engaged university, but if we're not, we're going to be pretty good. I mean, it's kind of, so, yeah. Hi. So, uh, anything else about that speech? Is there the, uh, the part of pulling people together? You know, again, that, it's really powerful, isn't it? We're in this together. There's a group of us, and it's us against the rest of the world. You, you see that in that speech as well. And again, I think, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a university or part of a university. If you can get that spirit, you know, it's us. We are this group. We are this really strong group. We will overcome. It's, it's a really powerful way to uh, motivate people, I think. I think that's exactly right. I try not to use I or my or me. Uh, it's, it's much more about us. I was on a plane uh, the other day. It was a Qantas plane. Um, and the flight attendant, uh, when she got on, she said things like, my team will do ever, anything to look after you. And then she said, I hope, at the end of the flight, she said, I hope my team have served you well. And it just grated on me. You know, my team. You know, I, I, it really grates on me when people say, my EA, or my secretary, or my executive officer. I don't know why, I, it just, yeah. I, even saying my wife, I mean, even that kind of grates on me just a little bit. If you use we and us, it's so much more powerful, I think. Does anyone agree, disagree with that? <coughs> no, yeah, I think, I think it's a really good point. And again, it's about when you use we and us, you're actually forming this group. When you say I and me, you're separating yourself out, which I don't think is anywhere near as, as motivating. Yeah. Now look, I'm, I'm spending a bit of time on this because I, I do believe that the communication and the, the speaking and talking to people, I mean that's probably the one tool that you've got to motivate people. Okay, there are some other things which we'll talk about in a minute, but actually when you're talking and getting things across, it is incredibly important. Um, I, I actually, if you, I, I did a master's in uh, government and politics and I got really interested in political speech making and uh, did a lot of analysis of speech making and why some people are good speech makers and why some aren't and interest in all the little tools that people use to make good speeches. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Claptrap is where you politicians actually set up devices uh, to make the crowd clap and you'll see them do it and then they stop because it's, they see it, they put pause in their speech, it says pause, pause, pause for applause. And you can actually make crowds do that. You know, and there's lots of little things. Like using groups of three. If you use groups of three, you know, we will do this, this, and this. You, often people will clap. Anyway. <laughs>
That's, so I am spending some time on this because I think it is important. I, I, I guess you can motivate people if you're a real boring bastard, but I'm not sure how really. You know, they, you know, as you sometimes see people. Hi, I'm here today to tell you about a fantastically exciting year ahead. <laughs> We're going to, and you think, oh, goodness sake, you know, have learned some skills, because these skills can all be learned. Um, okay, let's have a look at someone else. Who's next? Oh, you're going to like this one a lot, or really hate it a lot. <laughs> I'm committed to moving Australia forward. That starts with a strong economy and the budget to surplus by 2013. I'm committed to stronger borders, cracking down on people smugglers and a new approach on population. Not a big Australia, but a sustainable Australia with major investment in solar and other renewables. First class schools, a strong economy, a sustainable Australia. Together, let's move Australia forward. Authorised Dan Martin, ALP Canberra. So what do we think of that? Yeah. And that was quite a difference, was it? I mean, this is obviously a very different kind of speech. Uh, I mean, one of the big differences here is that she's covering a number of topics. Whereas I think the other two, the two guys, were very much, you know, the end of discrimination. I have a degree. Uh, it was a very simple message. I have a dream. There will be an end of discrimination against black people. Uh, Churchill we are going to defend the island, we're going to fight and defend the island. This is slightly different because we've got a whole number of different things. Does, does that make it more powerful or less powerful? Sorry? I think the message is a bit diluted because you might have a degree from one of those areas and think it's rhetoric. So. Yeah. It's probably fit for purpose. What she's trying to do, she's got that block of time and, she, you know, she is going to cover a number of subjects, but I think it is powerful if you've got one message and you keep on that message. But we accept that she's doing this for a second. Anything else about Julia there? Yeah, I think that... Yeah, it, it, so there was that element of we're in this, we're in this, it's the whole of Australia. We're, 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 so we're, yet again, we see that element of we're in this together. It is interesting, the use of family, isn't it? How about the use of repetition? Did she move him forward? Did she do it very well? Why didn't she do it well? Uh, well, maybe. I mean... Yeah, some, peop some people hated uh, uh, Churchill with a vengeance, thought he was an absolute clown, hated him. Martin Luther King, someone shot the poor bastard. Uh, and then, you know, so you, there are going to be people that you don't take to, and that's fine. But the, the actual use of the repetition, where I think she failed is too, actually, I don't think she said it enough. And the other problem she had, she didn't, say it the same. It was moving forward, then let's move forward together. And she didn't use, I mean, people, if it, it should be simple. Moving forward, we're moving forward. We're mo you know, yes we can, yes we can, yes we can. Not, uh, yes we're gonna try, yes, yes we might. You know, it was the same. So I think she was a bit weak on that. Anything else about that one? Which firmly and unmistakably underlines. <laughs> and then a politician emerged who also believed that people should be allowed to express themselves. Instead of being controlled by the state, the individual should become the central focus of society. Some socialists seem to believe that people should be numbers in a state computer. We believe they should be individuals. We're all unequal. No one, thank heavens, is quite like anyone else, however much the socialists may pretend otherwise. And we believe that everyone has the right to be unequal. But to us, every human being is equally important. A man's right to work as he will, to spend what he earns, to own property, 
To have the state as servant and not as master, they are the essence of a free economy. And on that freedom, all our other freedoms depend. <laughs> God, you can't help laughing at that, can you? Um, what do we think of that one? Motivating? You, you, you actually can listen, you can actually listen to the words and you, I don't know you can't you don't agree with them but you can't help but agreeing with them. It's kind of really motivating, I think. Considering Thatcher was actually a terrible speaker. I mean, when she first came into power, she had to have elocution lessons. She was so, and she, she sort of built up to that. I, I think pretty motivating. Anything in there? What What was some of the techniques she were using? Yeah. W using we, yeah, we we are together in this. Who were the enemy? The socialists. Yes. Yeah, so she uses repetition. She sets it up as it's us against the socialists. And it's quite interesting listening to that now. She says things that you, you don't hear anyone say anymore, do you? No. We are all unequal. We celebrate that we're unequal. People are, it's quite, it's really quite powerful, isn't it, when she says that. Anything else in there? To be honest, I'm not sure when that speech comes. I don't. It's it's a really. Uh, well, I'll have to look at what that's all about because it's intriguing that she starts doing. But she just. I mean, the guy that's trying to make a speech. I mean, she just cuts straight through him, doesn't she? I mean, she's. You know, I, I don't. There's all sorts of imagery there, isn't there? You know, tidying up, getting rid of the rubbish and the dust. Get out of here, mate. Uh, anyway, but. It, it, that's your homework. Find out what that was all about. Um, uh, the music, I mean, you know, doesn't that show how powerful music is as well? And, you know, you, you felt fired up. But there was something strange about that music. Did anyone notice anything strange about that music? Well, what was it? Oh, come on, you must know what that music was. Huh? Well, it was, it was Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem. Now, can anyone say anything odd about having Jerusalem? Well, first of all, it, 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 it's one of the national songs of, of the UK. I mean, it is an uplifting song. It's played on the last night of the proms. It brings a, a you know, you choke up when you hear it and all of that. But it's a socialist song. It's actually one of the theme songs for the Labour Party. You know, if you have a look at the words of it, it's about, you know, creating, you know, this, how the dark satanic mills, these evil capitalists running dark satanic mills, and we will overcome capitalism to build Jerusalem on England's green and pleasant land, you know. And there it is being used by the arch capitalists. Very interesting, but it just shows the power of music. And, uh, you know, music has sort of been used through the years to motivate people. I mean, why would you put a band at the front of an army that are just going to go and get house shot out of them? Anyway, so. Just last point. For a, for a video clip, like, like a lot of the ones that you showed previously, they were like of a deliberate uh, and or a yep. This is where you need to put me, yeah. That's yeah. 
This, I, you're exactly right. And imagery, I mean, if you want to really, you know, you, you probably just see it as wallpaper and you don't even notice it, but just, just sometimes just spend a few minutes just looking at some of the imagery that's presented to us and political imagery, you know, the, and also adverts on TV. I mean, they will spend millions of dollars on producing an advert. And what is that advert doing? It's trying to motivate you to go and buy something that you don't particularly want. So you actually see, you know, all that kind of imagery crammed into that stuff. It's really uh, interesting when you look at that. This is the next one. Um, I think this was, again, about when I started here, about being inclusive and really letting everyone know that they're part of this. And, you know, if you're going to start from somewhere, you never start with a clean sheet, isn't it? but let's say, you know, we're going to start with a clean sheet of the state. So the science tech group, everyone knows that they are the worst group in the university. Bunch of troublemakers, you know, all never arrive to 11 o'clock usually. But you actually say, we're going to be the best group in this university. We're going to start afresh. Doesn't matter what's happened before. Now we're going to really do this in a fantastic way. We are going to be the best group in the university. And, and we can start with a clean sheet of paper. However, if then, if you actually start and you create that vision and that's where we're going to go and you actually say we're all starting with a clean sheet, we know there's been some behaviours in this university that have not been good, but we're going to forget that's in the past. We're now moving forward. Moving forward. Moving forward. Yes, we can. Uh, but if people carry on those old behaviours of the past, then what do you do? Well, you give them a chance to train, you try and re-educate them, and then you get rid of them. So, but give everyone a chance to get on board the bus. Um, so, and again, it is about getting out and talking to people. So you did see, particularly at the, um, you know, in the higher management levels in the university, I mean, a lot of people did, everyone had a chance to get on board, but some people didn't feel comfortable with the way we were going and they departed the university on the whole. And that's okay. I mean, people, if they're not comfortable, move on, and that's fine. And that might be the same in your areas, people move on. And that might not actually be moving to the university, but they might move out of your group. Because um, one of the big demotivating things is having really whingy kind of people in there, isn't it? I, I always think in the university there's, there's three kinds of people. There's, there's those that are really, um, you know, they're really motivated, they're really on tune, they really want to make the university a good place. We've then got a, a, some people that are sort of whingy and, you know, they'll always see the glass half full. But they are a group that you can work with and, you know, you can get them on board. They're, on the whole, they're good people. And if you can just get them to see the relevance of where you want to be, then they will join in and they will move forward with you. They, they can be changed from, you know, the whingy kind of person to the really well-motivated people. And then you've got a third group, which are in a tiny minority who are the really toxic, malignant people. And it doesn't matter what you do, you are never going to move them on. They will be cynical about, cynicism kills motivation. They'll be cynical about everything and they will just try and undermine all the time. And, you know, really your only remedy is to get rid of them. And that might be in a very humane way, uh, but you've got to get rid of them, I think. I don't think we do that well in the university. I think, you know, we, we probably should move those people on a lot more quickly, but uh, it, it is a bit difficult. But would you agree with that, those, those three groups? Any fourth group? I guess there's some of the ultra keen. They get on your wick as well, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else have we got in there? Okay, recognition, and we, we started talking about this before. I mean, recognition is uh, really important. What have I got up here? Um, there's nothing motivates more than recognition, and I'm not talking about a 10% bonus, but it, it might be just telling someone that they've done a good job. That, 
just motivates people so much. I don't think I do enough of it, and I don't think any of us do much about it. But I remember I, I got quite carried away with this once, and I was sort of, did you remember I put that email? At least tell one person a week that they've done a good job in the university. And uh, that actually got some uh, adverse stuff from some of the managers. Uh, and uh, someone got, I think someone almost got reprimanded for saying well done to someone. Because uh, this manager thought, well, it's just, you, it's just your job and you shouldn't expect to get praise. So I actually sent well done to everyone in that person's department. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so anyone's experience of, do you find that you're recognised in your areas? Is there recognition in the university or is it something we could do more of? It's there. Yeah. Is it there enough? It's getting better. Yeah. It's not something to expect otherwise. It's better. I mean, it's better. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I come into you every day and say, doing a fantastic job there next day, fantastic job, it, it becomes meaningless. But when you have done a good job, when you've put yourself out and people do put themselves out and someone says, oh, you know, that was fantastic. You know, we had that res score in. I thought it was just going to collapse because there were, you know, we thought they were going to be 20 turned up. There were 40. We only, we were doing dissection and we only got 20 hearts. You know, it was just amazing how you put yourself out. You went down and you found those, you brought them back. And you know, I know that that really added into your own personal time you know, a big thank you for that. But I think you should probably go further and say, and here's a bottle of wine or something. There is a, a group called, I think it's called Red Balloon, and I was looking at that for the university, which is just a group which looks at those recognition. And my wife was a head of a, a medical imaging department, an ultrasound department, and they had all of these kind of awards that they could give. And it could be anything from just saying thank you, it could be a bottle of wine, right up to a weekend away. If someone really put themselves out and, you know, let's say worked a weekend because one of the machines had gone down, you could actually go to them and say, look, no, you gave your weekend up, so we want to give you one back. So here's a, a, a hotel and transport to go to a hotel with your partner and thank you very much. And you think how powerful that kind of uh, stuff is. Or just say, here's a voucher, go and have a meal with your partner, just a thanks from the university. Now, I think we should be doing that stuff a lot more. So some homework for everyone in here next week, maybe even today, send at least one email recognising that someone has done a good job, if they've done a good job, that someone's done a good job, and then also copy it to their supervisor and to me. I mean, there's, there's, you know, whether it's right or wrong, we all get a nice warm feeling, don't we, when we get that kind of email that, you know, thanks very much, you did a really good job uh, there, fantastic. And then you notice that it's been copied to your supervisor and to the vice chancellor. There's some that really, I don't know. It makes it more real, more heartfelt and, and meaningful if you've copied. So, uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen. 12, 14, 16, Sometime next week, I'll be expecting to see 19 emails, recognising the good job someone else has done in my e-book. I mean, if no one does a very good job next week, then, <laughs> wow. But the funny thing is, we all know they will. There will be someone that does, goes out of the way. I mean, I, I, I sent an email this week to Mari Foreman. Does anyone work with Mari? I mean, I'm just hearing some great stuff about her. Um, so, anyway, good. Let's move on. No, I'm going to, no, before I move on, I just, there's something in my mind and I don't think I've covered it on here. The other thing that I think is a great tool for motivating people, if you can, is let people have access to some resources. And we did that work with the, um, uh, the professional staff, but I think it was professional staff at level six and uh, lower than level six. Well, some of the things we're doing in the university are very hard. And uh, two years ago, we had, uh, we're talking about feedback from students on their programs. We had a feedback of around about 4%, 4%.
Last year we moved that up to 30%. So we went from 4% to 30%. And now our target for this year is 50%. We know that's tough, but that's where the vision is. The vision is that we connect with our students, uh, we get their feedback, we change the programs based on that feedback, and uh, people that got the target last year and the ones that will get the 50% this year, we will recognise. We will recognise. We know it's hard, we know it's tough, but people are out there doing it, uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. So no one said it's going to be easy, uh, and we know it's tough, and we will recognise people when they do that. Uh, and we're probably not going to recognise you because you got 40%. So pull your finger out and get 50%. <laughs> Still, I'm sending emails. But two, I, I, two emails, I might appear with different tone to the students. Why this staff is sending too much email to for feedback yeah. from students? So, yeah, I know, I look, I know it's tough, and from going to probably where you were before, around about 4% up to 40% is a great achievement. I mean, I, I accept it's a great achievement, but we need to get up that up to 50% and beyond for all sorts of reasons, funding reasons, so we are committed to that. I mean, I, my wife's a lecturer here as well. I mean, I, she just hounds them into the ground until they do it. I mean... Uh, but I do accept that sometimes things are tough, and I guess it is tough when you think you're doing a really good job and you know everyone else around you is getting the recognition and you're not because you haven't quite made that hurdle. Um, I accept that. Can I just go back to those um, level six and below? So we realised that we weren't actually doing much for them. A lot of a, a lot of the academics and you know the managers they're at conferences every five minutes. It's like junket city, isn't it, around here? But the real workers, not a lot put on. So we put a conference on, which went really well. And then we also said at that conference, how much do we make available? Well, we, we said, give us your ideas. If you've got some good ideas, how you can improve your work area, either for the staff or the students, we will make a couple of thousand dollars available with it. I can't remember, but we, we gave people uh, a couple of thousand dollars. And these were sort of, level fives and level fours, sixes, and we gave them a couple of thousand bucks. Now, what the amazing thing about that was is just what an impact that had, because a lot of people had never actually had $2,000 just to spend on whatever they want. We didn't really put any confines on it. And you ought to see what people have done. They have uh, some of the wading areas. There's one in Bundaberg that I always think about. It used to be this awful bland area with nothing in it. Now it's got chairs, it's got a water feature, a sofa, plants. And we gave it, if you, if you <laughs> anyone here from facilities management? Good, we slag them off then. Uh, if you give $2,000 to facilities management and say, can you improve this reception area, they look at 2,000 bucks and just laugh. Well, you want a sofa, that's gonna cost you $6,000. We gave it to the people who actually work in those areas. They were down at Super Amar negotiating for the best deal on a sofa. They then went and got you know, a deal at Bunnings on a water feature that had a little crack on the bottom of it, so they got 50% off. They got this, the plants, they brought the plants in from home and just, and you know, you just see people motivated and it makes a real difference. So I think there's, an, uh, there's a, probably a, a moral to that story as well. If you can give people some resources and actually say, we trust you, we trust you with a couple of thousand bucks, um, you get incredible results, incredible. Do you guys, that, the people that put hands up that, you know, level six or whatever, do, do you get any resources that you can actually spend in your area? What did you get? Yep. Some of the, um, the reception areas. Coffee and machines. And that, those staff came back and, and it was just fantastic that they were able to do that. It's yep. really good. They were all talking to each other about the different things that they'd submitted ideas and things. And they so. got approval. Some of them got approval for those ideas. And it's been great. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So just little things like that. I think they can be quite motivating just to realise that you're not just um, just a drone, just working away and never given any responsibility. Um, what have we got next? Okay, critics. Now, it's very easy to get uh, tied down, and probably I'm looking at this for university level. Keep your critics close. And I did talk about those three groups of staff, you know, the really uh, enthusiastic, do anything, the whingy ones, and the sort of malignant ones. We forget about the malignant ones. But you can get criticism from in the organisation, and you can quite often get criticism from the unions, and I'm thinking this. And it's easy to actually see your critics as your enemies. And you see a lot of vice chancellors falling into, I think, a massive trap of seeing the union as the enemy. Now, I can honestly say that I see the unions in a completely different light. I see the unions as the staff. I mean, the unions, for a lot of people, are their representatives. And, you know, if you actually see the unions as your enemy, you're actually seeing the staff as the enemy. And that's really bad news if you see the staff as the enemy. So we've worked, I mean, John Fitzsimmons, uh, who is probably the union leader I have most to do with, I mean, we work very closely together. Uh, and I see the unions and John as, uh, you know, a real part of taking the university forward. And I think, at a, you know, at a, a more, um, at a, a different level, if you're looking at parts of the university, do have a look at the people that are criticising you. It's very easy just to sort of, uh, they're talking rubbish. Listen to what they say and then decide if they're talking rubbish. Because sometimes your critics are the people that can really uh, make things work really well. I mean, nobody knows everything and no one knows the best way forward. I'll give you an example, and this is a big example. The engineering. You've all seen the engineering labs. I guess you guys work in the engineering labs. Uh, pretty good? Oh, well, you know, go and have a look at the engineering labs. Go on, go and have a look now. Uh, uh. Yeah, they look pretty good, don't they? They look pretty good, and inside they're fantastic. What did I want to do with that building? I wanted to put a bulldozer through it. I was actually going to pull it down and make a little garden there. That was my idea, to the point where I'd done the business plan for it, and everything was written up. I'd taken it to council. I'd taken it to the uh, PRC. Uh, I'd taken it to council, and I'd actually got tick off on uh, all of that stuff. Uh, it was all agreed and the bulldozer was moving in. There was then a group of staff and alumnus, alumni and students that came to me en masse and said, you can't do this, your plan is absolutely stupid because we were going to move engineering down to the old printery building. They said, it's absolutely stupid and that building could be revamped. And, and basically I said to them, well, look, I'm going to put the, uh, next Wednesday the bulldozer's coming to knock it down. Uh, if you produce me a plan which makes sense, I'll have a look at it. They actually went away and they more or less worked all weekend flat out and they bought a plan in and I looked at this plan and I mean, I'd, I'd, I'll be honest, when they came and saw me, I was pretty pissed off because, you know, I'd got this plan, I had this great idea, I'd got it past my bosses, the council, and here they were yabbering on about I'd got it wrong. When I looked at their plan, it was obvious I'd got it wrong. Uh, and I went back to council and I had to say, you know, I did get it wrong. And in fact, there is a better way forward and this is about, and they, oh, what an idiot. But we have got a great result, haven't we? I mean, the, the engineering building now is just fantastic. It was done at a good price. So do listen to your critics. Uh, because you can sometimes get a better result. And also, if you always do dismiss your uh, critics, that can be really di uh, very uh, uh, demotivating for them as well, I think. Uh, next. Oh, look, lead by doing. Uh, one thing that you notice, uh, everybody uh, watches the boss. I mean, everybody watches what I do. But you watch what your supervisor does. You watch what the deputy vice chancellors do. And you know, people watch what you do as well. Because in situations, we're all sometimes the boss. 
and people watch what you do all the while. And if you don't live what you're saying, you just, well, you demotivate people, but you lose all credibility. So you're leading 24-7, uh, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're always leading. And as I said before, you change culture every time you do something. Every time you do something, you change the culture. And it's really your decision. Are you gonna change the culture for the better or for the worse? And um, so, you know, you need role models as well. So why is that picture there? You know, it's very difficult to come into uh, a university and say, look, money is very tight. Um, and we are going to have to cut back. I mean, particularly in the professional areas, the last two years for the professional areas have been really tough. We've, we've literally frozen the budgets for two years. Uh, the, the salaries have gone up. So the only way we've been able to get the money for the increases in salaries is to have cuts in those professional areas. Now, we are coming out of that period and things will ease up a little bit going forward, but for two years it's been pretty tough. Now, how can I come in and say that's what we're going to do, and then you're going down, you've been asked to go uh, down to the Sydney campus, you get on a plane, and guess who's sitting in business class? Me. I mean, what's that going to say? Oh, well, why should I be worried about trying to save money if he's paying $3,000 more just to sit on an aeroplane for two hours? I mean, you know, so, you know, hopefully when you see me in an aeroplane, I'm sitting in economy class. Occasionally they do upgrade me, but I'd never pay for a business class. If I'm, but I'll be honest with you, if I'm going overseas, I fly business if I'm working the next day. But what I'm saying, that's just a little example. You've got to live what you're saying. You can't actually be saying something and then do be people seeing you do something else. And people will know. I mean, you know, I know that when I go and spend something on the credit card for the university, if it's going to be something outrageous, if I go into a restaurant when I'm traveling and I buy a 200 buck bottle of wine, I'm pretty sure that just about everyone in the university will get to know about that. Now, I know finance is confidential and, and they never leak, but I know everyone will know that. And it's also about yourself, isn't it? I mean, if, if you're doing that, then you're not really... So I'm just making a few points that if you are going to take a leadership role, if you are really going to try and inspire and motivate people, you've actually got to walk the talk. You can't just talk it. People have got to be seeing you do the right thing. Um, you know, you can't go and, you know, stand in front of a staff forum and be nice and friendly and say, well, and then as soon as I get out, I'm a real shit. You know, you, you, you pass me in the, in the uh, grounds and I just don't even bother looking at you. I mean, if, if that's the message, then you're not going to get anywhere. So, um, so lead by doing, not just saying. Um, I think that's about all I had to say, really.